And I will say thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Michelle, for joining us. And I would like to introduce Michelle, my friend and wonderfully published author. I am so excited for her, um, who's here today to tell us about her experience. So take it away, Michelle. Thank you, Mary Allison. Thank you for having me. Uh, this is a pleasure to be here. Uh, my first uh, debut novel say, cheese novel, say Cheese and Murder, was published in October. And uh, it's a cozy mystery. And um, yeah, it was a, quite a joy ride for me. Um, you know, you just like how I wrote the book and go on with that. Sure. OK, um, so uh, I'm Michelle. I have 10 children. I have two sets of twins, so the numbers go up kind of fast that way. So, and we've been homeschooling for 17 years. We were doing it well before it was the trendy thing to do. And uh, my daughter, Abby, uh, was turning 11 a bunch of years ago in 2015. And she was into Nancy Drew, Sherlock Holmes, all of those things. And she wanted a murder mystery party. And we said, okay, sure. And her birthday's in January. And, um, I went looking for a murder mystery party. And the thing is the murder mystery parties are made for adults. They have adult themes, they have adult concepts and adult secrets. And for an 11 year old party with family members and younger and older kids, not appropriate at all. So I said, oh, well, look, they had some kid ones. So we went to go look at the kid ones and they were stupid. The dog stole the cake, the baby hid the keys. And she's like, mom, I want a body. <laughs> so, you either get your kid therapy or you write them a murder mystery and I tell us the second option um so I got a book on Amazon called how to write your own murder mystery and after 10 days I put it together and we had family members who were part of it and we had a grand time I played the obnoxious lady that gets bummed off uh, for the first half and then I played the um detective in the second half of the party so I could guide things along now, the funny part of this is Abby did not solve it. She did solve it after all was said and done. She was disappointed. <laughs> I was like, you've got to be kidding me, kid. <laughs> you've got to be kidding me. So I said, oh, I'll turn it into a novel and make her character solve it. Like, that is just like such an easy thing to do. So fast forward three years later. Um, well, now this is the part that sounds a little crazy. And if you're not a writer or whatever, that these characters kept bugging me. They kept bugging me. They, they pop up in my dreams. They pop up when I'd be, you know, doing the dishes. Like, I should really get to write that. And they would just keep bugging me. And I saw somebody who was a screenwriter um, uh, talking about on a video that about, about their characters and things. And he says, you know what? And sometimes you write stuff and you put it away. I said, and these characters keep coming at you and bugging you in your dreams and in your and you need to go back there. There's a gem there. There's either a story or a character or something. You need to go back there. And that, and right around the same time, uh, my friend Joe Clintz had said, post, post on Facebook about the Corning Writers Group. And I was like, there's a writers group in the area? <laughs> so he showed me the link. And um, February 1st, 2018 was the first day I showed up for the uh, Corning Area Writers Group run by Michelle Wells. Run very, very well by Michelle Wells. And I showed up and it was one of those scary things. I'm sitting in the parking lot going, I'm not going to go in. No, no, no. And then I yelled at myself because if my kid was saying that, because I'm an extrovert, I'd be like, get in there. It's fine. Just go. You Be scared for 20 seconds and just, just go. And if it's terrible, you don't have to go back. So I had to give myself my own pep talk. And I walked in and it turned out I made some wonderful friends and the book ended up coming from that. So initially, I was not planning to publish this publicly. I wanted to write it as a novel for Abby and for the people who had participated in the party and give it to them. And the writers group, they were, they're, they're such an amazing group of people. And they were very encouraging about, I think it's like chapter eight, nine, 10. They're like, you know, this is a good enough story to be published. I'm like, nah, yeah, yeah. And um, by chapter 18, about halfway through the book, that's when I was like, I think I'm going to publish this. So I did the research about going the traditional route where you have to send in letters and, and basically beg them, please look at my book, please, to, please publish this. And then I looked at self-publishing and went, yeah, that's the way I'm going to go. So that's what I did. And the one thing about traditional publishing is that 
Um, they t do a lot of the legwork that you don't have to do. You don't have to learn about cover design. You don't have to learn about formatting or any of that stuff, but you do lose some of you the control of it. And being a homeschool mom of 10 and, homes and homeschooling for so many years, I do have control issues. So I <laughs> wasn't really gonna give up some of that stuff. Um, the one thing was the cover. I had a very clear vision of what I wanted for the cover. And a lot of the cozy mysteries, they have um, like a, almost a formula of how they look. They have like a little white cartoon chick standing in front of someplace looking kind of sassy. And I'm like, I didn't want that. Uh, I wanted something different. So I actually brought with me some of my ideas. He, I started with some other ideas and I had this, which then turned into this because I hired a professional designer. And, but the designer I used was uh, JD and J Design and they were fantastic because I said, hey, I would like Lucerne glasses. And look, they put that on my, cause these are my, my wedding crystal and that's the ones we use. So they put that on there and I was able to personalize it and they were fantastic to work with. It was a steep learning curve of learning about all this stuff. Um, and last year I spent, um, I had finished <clears throat> writing it and, and, and I headed to the editor and then all the marketing and that stuff. Um, yeah, and then it was published in October. So yeah, uh, <laughs> what else to talk about? <laughs> um, so how did, to me and knowing you a little bit, um, it's like you did your own homeschooling thing for the process of the project that you wanted to do, which I think is a wonderful example for your family and your kids to see that adults learn how to do things and they have to figure stuff out too. That's a great example. But how did your family, aside from the party and Addie, how did they fit into this? Did they proofread for you? Did they give you character names? Those kind of things. They, they were excellent the whole process. Um, when I was writing the party, um, I need to talk things out. And I had that to those 10 days and I was going crazy because I couldn't figure, I was trying to get this web all together and I wanted all my kids to be able to try to figure it out. But my son, Daniel, um, volunteered. He says, Ma, I could be your sounding board. <clears throat> Lots of ideas off of me because I know how you work, whatever. His only request was he said, I want to name my character. And I said, it's got to be English. You're the butler. Come up with something. So he comes. He comes back and goes. Archibald Fartworthy. All right, that's your name. <laughs> so he created that character, and he's that's the only one that I did not create. Um, and I loved it. It was perfect, and it just set off with the other names creating those that it made it much easier to have some silly names, whatever. So he's the only one that couldn't solve it because he knew all the different pieces of it. Um, and different children had different roles along the way. Um, my kids who were still being homeschooled absolutely loved correcting my chapters, taking a red pen. Mom, this is a clunky sentence. You've got to fix this. They just love it because that's what I do with their essays and stuff. And yeah, they got a little bit of a payback. And then I got to hear, um, I got to know how to have the receiving end of that. And I could be a little bit uh, uh, less harsh, I guess, <laughs> afterwards when I did theirs. Um, and like people would just bounce different ideas. I, I would bounce ideas and like, no, no, no. And Abby was very, there was sometimes I was going in a direction with Cassandra who she has, that was her character. She's like, no, Cassandra would never do that, mom. You can't do that. She can do that. And um, yeah, she was very adamant. And there were times that we got into a discussion and I was mad because I was like, no, this is, I'm the author here. I can decide. <laughs> and then turns out she was spot on with, Cassandra's um, personality and characteristics and other stuff. The funny part is that it, there's a lot of Cassandra that's me. I, I, actually, there's different parts of me in all the characters. Even Baron Rupert Von Pickle, who if you haven't read the book yet, is quite a snarky individual. Um, yeah, I, it's, the, the thing about his character is uh, he's very snarky with a lot of people. And a lot of his dialogue is pretty much came out of my head as is it's very it's not edited very well no, it's edited well but it, there wasn't a lot of taking that out and my friend Jerry has said at one after reading one particular chapter said to me she's like, uh, you're a very sweet girl and yet you have a dark side and I like it <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah it was uh interesting and my um yeah my son 
my sons uh, would come and, and he'd be like, what are we working on today? And my little guys, my little, my, my second set of twins, the little boys. And they were all very, very helpful. Uh, and sometimes they would give me these great ideas that I hadn't even thought of. And um, the morning that I finished the first draft, I had, I was already editing it. And I had a deadline because I had a, I had booked an editor. It was February 3rd of last year. And I had done uh, all the chapters and then I had done the last two chapters. So I was trying to pull the last three chapters. I was trying to like pull them together and it was just not working. And I got to the last chapter and I'm trying to like pull this together. And I got to a point where I was just, it was in the morning, the kids, we hadn't started school yet. And I typed the last bit of it and I went, oh, that's it. That was the, the last, it was the, it was a puzzle piece where you can't find it and you find it and you click it in place and you just step back and go, oh, it's done. And they went, what? I said, I finished the first draft. And they were cheering. And yeah. my, my little one who was um, just on seven at the time took my face and in her hands and she goes, mommy, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> and that was, that, was, that was a great moment for me that they were just like, yeah. And they've been cheering me on. And when it got on Amazon, they were all cheering. On the day that I finished the first draft, they're also stinkers. They're like, mom, we should celebrate today with a day off from school. You got your first draft done. <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> so because we could do that. So we did. Um, but yeah, it was it was an interesting thing. And I, I've had a lot of support from my my husband and my, and my family. My husband's not a mystery reader. So he's read some stuff of it. Um, but how he supported me was um, that he... Uh, he took the kids every Saturday morning to go shopping at Wegmans and get them out of the house. Cause I get up early. I get up at four 30 in the morning um, to write and then do the writing first. And then as the kids are getting up and whatever, sometimes it's like, yeah, I'm going to roll, go do something. Um, but most times I have to stop and then put, take off writer hat and put on mom hat and teacher hat and keep going. But on a Saturday he would take them so I could continue for a few hours on a Saturday and um, at different times, take them out and go, yeah, go work on your stuff. You're a lot happier when you, you have time to, to get some words out. So um, yeah, I've been blessed that way. So it was a, a nice environment to be able to create this because people are like, how the heck did you write a book with homeschooling? I wasn't homeschooling all 10 of them. Five of them have graduated. Actually, no, one had still, that was the year he, he, we, I started. He was still child number five graduated high school then. So I've been homeschooling five kids um five have graduated my school and they've all graduated college so they're at and four of them are out of the house um so yeah I couldn't have done this with toddlers or infants or nursing twins because you know that was just survival that those years um, <laughs> um wonderful um another question that I have and I'm sure others would have questions too um when you're writing something like this a mystery in particular is there kind of, do you have an outline in your brain of how it's going to go that kind of gives you a direction or do you just sort of write as you go and then go back and plant things in the past or how does that work? Both, both. Um, I, because I had the party, I had the outline. I had the party for the first, the first eight chapters of the party scene. The rest of it, I was making it up, but I knew who did it. And I knew the web of secrets of basically what happened. But as I was writing things, things just came up that, wait a minute, this person can have this connection. If I go back and put this into this chapter, then that's a breadcrumb that could follow to that. So I think with a mystery, you really do need to plan at least some, at least the big chunks of, all right, what happened, who did it, when, why they did it. And then you can put in the other chunks there. And then it just kind of like organically kind of like grows together like vines on a, on a wall. And when you step back and go, that's cool. <laughs> it's, it's a really satisfying moment when um, you know, someone said, I could not see that coming, but yet it absolutely made sense because you put stuff in there um, beforehand. And that's the one thing with writing a cozy mystery. There are certain things you have to do with a cozy that um, have to fit into the genre, like other stories and stuff, it's, but there's, you have to have a little bit of romance. It's got to be clean. Um, <clears throat> and people's definition of clean varies, but mine is clean, clean. I want my kids to be able to read it. 
I want my mom and my mother-in-law to read it and not be embarrassed. Like, yeah, don't, don't read my book. You know, um, it also has to have, well, you have to play fair. You have to play fair. If, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> if you needed to know who was the general at the Battle of Monmouth in the Revolutionary War, and that was the key bit of information, you need to put that in. Some character has to say that at some point. It can't be some random information that's just out there that's like, oh, this is what who was, was doing. It was generally, you know, that can't happen because then the readers feel cheated that they couldn't figure it out because you want it to be, and this is the hard part, it has to be hard enough so it's not so easy because if you look on Amazon reviews, if they can, if people can solve it in the first 50 pages, they'll ding you. They'll give you a one, one star review. It's too easy to figure out. But if it's so hard that no one can really figure out because you don't play fair, they'll ding you for one or two star reviews because you didn't play fair. You didn't say, you didn't give it all that they could have figured out all the puzzle pieces. And that's kind of, it's like you're the villain, <laughs> the reader is the, is the protagonist and you've got to play that back and forth. Um, and it's, it's really kind of an interesting thing to, and it's a, it's a tricky balance. It really is. It's a tricky balance. And um, when I was writing my book, because I was new to novel writing and the writers group was really just so, I, I can't say enough about them. They're just, they're friends of mine and they're just delightful and we get, they read the chapters and you bring it back and you're like, no, oh, I don't agree with them, but then you know that they're right. And then just sometimes they're wrong because they don't know what's coming up later on. But you're like, all right, someone has that thought reading this, how do I have to change it so it's more clear or that they don't get that idea or a character says exactly what they're saying and a character says no. Like <laughs> one character has, um, travels with her, has a book next to her side of the bed wherever she goes. And someone said, oh, it's a Bible. And I'm like, no, it's not a Bible. You won't find out till later on. So I had a character say, oh, a Bible. And she goes, no. So that answers the question because you're getting feedback from other people of what a reader might have in their head so they can move on from that instead of obsessing on that. And just get, and it's also misdirection. Like you want them, hey, start thinking of that character over there. And that was great because some people had latched onto a character like, I know it's this one. I know it's this one. So I wrote more stuff that made it look like it was that person. <laughs> and it was like, yeah, no, you're wrong. I know what's going on. So the writer's group didn't know who did it until the end. I didn't want to show all my cards, so to speak, because I wanted them to discover it along the way. And then I could, you know, find out if they thought it was um, enough to, to, enough to, enough clues to figure it out. The problem is with the writer's group, you do read one chapter and then a few weeks later you read the next, you're not reading it front to back. But I do have beta readers who did do that and they're like, yeah, yeah, this part was easy to figure out. This part was hard. This this one works. This doesn't work. So, yeah, it was it was a steep learning curve for all of it. And for the kids, like you said, for the kids to watch me go through their process, and I would talk about it and saying, I have no idea. And when I would get stuck, and that was the other thing that was great to show the kids when I got stuck on the chapter. Um, like I said, I had got to almost to the end. I had the last five chapters. I wrote the last two because I knew where they were. These three chapters, they drove me crazy because you had to tie up everything. And that's another thing people will ding you like, we never found out what happened or whatever. And I, I hate when books leave me like that, unless it's a, it's like, wait, you had that cup of milk on the thing. It was such a huge thing and you never answered that. Oh, you want to hurt people. Anyway, um, so when I couldn't figure things out, I did other things like the cover, um, I would draw the cover or I would um, research marketing things about what I was gonna do afterwards when everything was published. And one thing I did do that was really helpful was I went on Amazon and I put in Cozy Mysteries and I read all the top ones, bad reviews. I read all the one and two reviews and like what bugs people about this genre or this book or this series unlikable protagonist they had um they they came the clues came out of nowhere all the things i had said you know <coughs> excuse me but the one big thing that helped me with my book it was that there were so many characters i didn't have a list to check back on so i was like aha 
So I made a list of characters because I had way too many people who wanted to be in the party. So I had way too many characters. Mm-hmm. And I made a list at the beginning of the book. And when people were reading it, they're like, oh, that list was great. I kept referring to it because I kept getting confused. Who was who? Mm-hmm. So the next for book two, there's going to be a few less characters to make it a little easier for people. Um, there is going to be a book two. So this is book one. I've already started writing it. I started in January. I have three chapters done. Um, still working on finding out the the main plot. I know where it takes place. I know who's going to be there, but it's, it's, it's not just gelling. So, and the same thing, um, <coughs> sometimes I'll write a scene that I know is coming up later on. And that's like nonlinear writing. Go ahead and write that and pop that in at some point when, uh, when I figure out the rest of it. <laughs> so any other questions? I, I like what you said. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm just jumping in here, but if somebody else has questions um, about having to plant clues just enough to keep people wondering, um, but not too much that it makes it easy to find out. Uh, my husband loves the Nero Wolf series by um, my brain, Rex Stout. Rex Stout Rex thank Stout. you. And um, they're they're very sort of Agatha Christie-ish. Lots of characters. And I remember reading one of them more than once and I had to look, there was one sentence toward the end of the book that made it turn. It was the pivotal sentence, but it was one sentence. Mm -hmm. That was the only clue, but that's part of what made it interesting to go back and read again because I forgot who done it. But it's, so that kind of subtlety takes some planning and um, I'm just, I marvel at how these things come together but like you say there's an organic process to it and the way your brain works and I've heard other writers say these characters are talking in my head I have to let them out that kind of thing and I will say that I have read the book very happy to read it and um, I think the best compliment I can give you is that it was as good as any other cozy mystery that I've read (laughs) I didn't I didn't think oh this was written by a first-time author Um, I mean I, I very much enjoyed reading it I didn't stumble on grammar or vocabulary or punctuation, those kind of things. I just read through it and I, and I really enjoyed it. So I, I heartily applaud you, um, Thank you. for Thank your you effort. And, and knowing that you've got, you know, you have a big family and the goat farm. Um, so there's a lot going on in your life. And I, I know you as a creative person as well. So you almost can't help yourself. Just yeah, I, 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 I can't help myself. Yeah, it's a kind of like a, a thing that I, you know, it needs to be an outlet or you explode, you know. Um, but the, as for the goat farm, I take care of the human kids. They, the kids and Kevin take care of the goat kids. So um, I can't claim <laughs> for that. Um, but yeah, the, the whole process is interesting. And it's, um, I know and it's, it's not something you can say, oh, I'm going to sit down. I don't have the luxury of saying, I'm going to go off into the woods and write a book for the next two months. I had to find time. That's why I get up at the ridiculous. It used to be 530, but then my kids were getting up earlier and I, and I was getting annoyed with them, especially with the time change. And then I ended yeah. up like, forget it. I just get up at 430 and I just find that time. Um, and it's basically one brick at a time to the path to publishing. It's one brick at a time. It's one sentence at a time. It's one YouTube video of how to, you know, do all of this um, and about character building. And um, I built a website last year. Uh, it's uh, michellepointisburdens.com. You can go there to have a blog about, about life and cheese and uh, writing and uh, also about my book on there. And so like the same thing with that, one brick at a time, like mm-hmm. watching videos on how to do it and how to put it together. And yeah. And so when I'm telling that to the kids, they're like, oh, okay. So they could see that I'm the process of it it's if you want something and something you want to go for you can't sit around and just go oh I wish someday I'm going to write a book yeah you can say that but if you're going to do something you you've got to put the bricks to get to that path to make your path to make your path um to get there so um yeah it was uh yeah it was, it was a lot of fun it was a lot of fun, and I'm yeah, obviously I'm doing it again. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> like like some, and some people like the the writing part, and they hate the editing. And some people are, I'm an extrovert, 
And um, a lot of my friends who are writers are introverts. So like the marketing part is like, oh, it's kind of a little scary. I'm like, yes, people, I get to talk. This is awesome. All right. So <laughs> I'm kind of an anomaly <laughs> sometimes because I don't mind that piece. And I don't mind, um, yeah, I have I, my joke about I have that talking thing. I'm just like, I have to keep doing it. Um, and, you know. Some of my, my characters have that talking thing too, because each part, one of them is part of me. And if there's stuff that I'm going through or having issues or whatever, you can't help. It comes and you bleed all over the page. You really do. So that there are issues and things that happen during the course of writing this book that you try to hide it and whatever. No. And then when you're reading your friend's stuff and you know what they're going through and what problems like marital problems or kid problems or whatever and you're reading their stuff and you're just like your heart hurts because you're seeing how they're dealing with it on there and i know people look at them but going oh okay yeah she's she's got some issues um <laughs> so it's not that everything in the book i have dealt with because there are some things in there that are are quite serious but you can imagine but the emotion that has you connected to other readers yeah that's and it's a place to, um, it was a way of keeping me off medication during a couple of stressful years. Uh, just, this was my therapy and going to a group and getting out of the house see, before COVID, getting out of the house once a week and remembering that I'm Michelle. That was a huge thing. And that was, that was great. I mean, I love being a mom. It's the best job I've ever done. And I wouldn't change it for a world. And I love homeschooling. Most days, except February and March, I hate homeschooling every February and March, every year, hate it. We're over that, so I'm, I'm good <laughs> now. Um, but uh, you do forget a little bit about that you're a person besides someone who gave birth to somebody. And the book and the writing, I uh, kind of rediscovered that and I'm like, hey, this is kind of cool. And my husband was very happy because he says, you're a lot happier since you've been going to the writer's group. And doing, I mean, yeah, writing a book is stressful, putting it together and whatever, but it's a different kind of stress. No one's living or dying because my book is, you know, but it's a, it's kind of a hobby and, you know, hopefully eventually it makes money. That would be great. <laughs> that would be fantastic. But if I went into it saying, all right, I want to pay off the mortgage with this and you're self-publishing, um, it's going to take a while. It's going to take a while and doing a series is the best way to actually eventually make money on it uh, because you have characters and people come back and they, they read your first book. Like you said, like, you're like, all right, it's the first author. The first time I, I don't know how this is going to be, but if they're like, Hey, I like this, these characters, I like her writing style. They'll buy your second and your third and fourth. Um, so yeah, if it eventually makes money, that would be super fantastic. I mean, I've, it's been very cool to have people buy my book. And people message me. I got a letter from somebody who's someone's mother who mailed me a letter. It was my first piece of fan mail. I was, I have it in my, I have my book with my tax stuff, whatever. It's, it's in there because I don't want to lose it. And it was just so awesome because um, just you put all this work in it and you're, you're hoping when you launch it out there, it's like, okay, I hope you like it. <laughs> and then <laughs> people do, it's very satisfying. Um, Jean, I know you sometimes have to leave a little early. Do you have any questions? Uh, no, I, I don't have to go today. I've been okay. uh, excused. But I do yeah. have a comment. I, I've been reading Anne Cleves. I'm not sure if you know who she is. A I've mystery heard of her. writer. Mm -hmm. Right. Anyway, but she's a great one for this misdirection. And I never knew that was a, a formula or something you should put in there. Because mm -hmm. sort of like in the last half of the book, she starts giving hints that it may be this person or maybe it's that one or giving them an excuse or a, a reason. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 that's very interesting. I never thought of that as a, a something that should be in mystery books. Because you don't want it to be so obvious that it's this person. And if you right. watch, you know, um, uh, Jessica Fletcher on Murder, She Wrote or the Hallmark movies, usually a lot of times person oh. you think it's going to be ends up falling out of the closet dead and it's, it's not them, you know. Um, so misdirection and red herrings are huge for right. 
having you be on your toes. And, and I love it when people are just like, oh, I know it's this person. I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> and, and, and I've done my Mary job. Alice, you don't did, know. Did, did you solve the mystery, Mary Alice, when you read her book? I'm trying to remember. I think I, I don't think I knew who it was. I mean, if it, maybe as I got closer. Mm -hmm. um, and when I think about it now, I don't necessarily specifically remember. And that's not necessarily... Um, <laughs> It's, I don't, I'm a very general picture. It's like, oh, I like the book. I enjoyed the reading process. Um, I couldn't exactly tell, I could tell you a little bit about it, but specifically not. Um, so I would say it's a book I could read again because I don't remember all the details and I don't really remember who did it. Not because it's not memorable, but because um, there's enough information to make it interesting to read again. And the other part with, with the cozy mystery that you need to do is that you need to make it fun for everybody. Because not everybody's going to figure out the big who done it. You need to have little things for people to have, oh, call that one. Like knowing who's going to die first or, or what the, the clue is for what's going to happen. Or um, you need to do these little things in there so that people can feel little victories along the way. Like, oh, wait. I bet you those two are involved. I bet you those two are involved. And then two chapters later, when they're like, yes, I called that. And those kinds of things help uh, keep the reader going. And also that if they do not solve it, they don't feel like, like kind of, like they didn't, they, they, they weren't, um, that it wasn't satisfying. It. Yeah, it, it needs to be <laughs> satisfying because part of the reason why people read Cozy Mysteries is because they like the puzzle. They like the puzzle of putting it all together. And some people are very good at figuring out a big picture thing. And some people are very good at picking out the little details. And you want to be able to cater to all of those people in terms of this, this particular genre. And by having small things of, um, I bet you something's, you know, not for my book, but I, I bet you that they mentioned that house and they mentioned it was rickety. I bet you that floor is gonna collapse. This wasn't in my book, but, um, and then you have it at the end of the book, the floor collapses during the big climax. You're like, yes, I call that. They may have figured out who was going to do it, but they called it that that was going to collapse. And that's helpful for people to just, you know, feel like they were part of it. And they were, they were, they may not have been the, the head detective, but they were, they figured out a piece. So. That makes sense. And, and you definitely did that because I remember certain times saying, oh, that's coming or whatever it was, those little things. You hooked me on those for sure because I got them. And yeah. I didn't want to be predictable either because certain, certain adult secrets are prevalent in like everything. If having an infidelity, it's, it's like everywhere. And I didn't want to have to explain that to an 11 year old. And also it's used easy in Midsummer Murders, if you watch that, there's like someone's always cheating on somebody else. Always. And it's like you pretty like that one and that one are involved. And like I'll turn it off after 10 minutes because forget it. I already figured it out. And that's what you don't want someone putting your book down when they figure it out. And but by doing that, you have to think of other secrets that adults want to keep. And you know, you have to go, you have to go off in a little weird direction that way. In, in my book, there are some. You know, you have to have secrets that are big ones and you have ones that are silly or ones that you just don't want people just to know, you know, like this is also not in my book, like someone paid for someone's college and they wanted to keep it secret or whatever. And if someone is hiding that, they're going to look guilty and they could look guilty for the big thing. And another thing for cozies, you're supposed to have two crimes or the appearance of two crimes. So I had to come up with a second one because I had just come up with the first one for the party and I was like, uh-oh, <laughs> reading all this, like, this checklist going, I got to do something else. So there was a, the second crime that, that came up that turned out, oh, no, I won't tell you <laughs> in case people haven't read the book. Um, I almost told you. <laughs> because yeah. I, liked that part. I liked that part a lot because I did not like that character at all. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted the killer. <laughs> so you enjoyed it, Marsha? Yeah, there, you know, I, I read all kinds of mysteries. Mostly I don't read cozies because they're a little too cozy for me, but 
you know, I was in the library one day and, well, this is after Mary Alice had read your book and she told me how much, you know, she was telling us all how much she enjoyed it and that the library had it. And then I was in one day talking to Michelle Wells and she was telling me. And so I thought, oh, okay. And of course the print <laughs> was too small in the book that the library has. So I got it for my Kindle. So see, I actually bought your book. And, <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, and I, what fascinates me about or what I really like about a mystery is that I learned something else that it, if somebody is really good with their facts and I loved your cheese facts <laughs> and that one cheese was pretty disgusting. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that was gross. <laughs> that is absolutely true. It is absolutely, all the cheese facts in there are true. So I have, I have cheese how am I here? She's research books. Uh, that these are, this is a new one I got. This one, this one is fantastic because um, I got this for the new book. Uh, this most of the cheese books are either by uh, country of origin or they're by um, like by alphabetical order or whatever. This particular one goes by taste. So if you like brie, the chapter for brie says these are like this, and then they'll have ones that are milder and ones that are and then the ones that are uh, or more intense, and then the other ones that have a, a different name, you know, like, wait, that's a brie, and the ones that are harder to find, and ones that are easier to find, and then they talk about them, so they call it like a um, launching off cheese, or something like that, and so if you're into blue cheese, and then there's Stilton, and Roquefort, and whatever, so there's different kinds, um, and it's just, got, it's just a fascinating book, and I'm sitting here, you know, eating it, <laughs> <laughs> eating it up. I didn't mean that, but <laughs> I did, I guess. Um, but that's just a great new resource for this new book because I'm like, all right, I want to include cheese facts with this. Um, cheese has always been an obsession. I don't know why, just has. And it just came out as, as a something like having these three rival cheese companies. So the new book is taking place. It's the last chapter from the first book. It's taking place in New York at a cheese conference at the Plaza Hotel in Manhattan. So if they're talking, if they're talking shop, you've got to have the facts. And that's also a thing with conversations that they don't, they take place in a, in a, you know, a lot of them take place in big shops and it's a lot with quilts and cats. And if anybody's a cat person, I'm sorry, I have, I'm a horrible allergy to cats. Cats are not my fan. I'm not a fan. There will be no cats in any cozy I ever made, make ever, ever, um, unless it's the killer. So um <laughs> i don't know how a cat can kill somebody but you never know it could also it always be, is a possibility um so they usually have something that you can that you find out about like there's a uh, there's a maple maple farm something cozies and it's all about making maple syrup and that that's wrapped up in that or there's a big shop or it's a uh i'm trying to think like a photographer and the cozies that have that a lot of times do need to include it to, to root it in reality. Mm -hmm. So I just happened to pick cheese and I did a lot of research. I uh, ate a lot of cheese and the people at Wegmans, I, if you look in the acknowledgements, I thank two of the people that worked in the old cheese department in the Corning Wegmans because I bugged them so much and saying, okay, why is this, why is this uh, stilt in different color than this? And they, Justin was fantastic. He told me all about it. And part of that went into the book um, and like asking me, asking them about different kinds of cheeses. And, and that's how it was a jumping off point. Oh, here, try this, you know, go after this book, you know. And then a friend of mine told me about the, that cheese you mentioned, the disgusting one, uh, Marsha, that she mentioned yeah. that. And I'm like, I have got to include that. For those who haven't read it, it's called Kazoo Marzu and it's um, made in Sardinia. And it's, um, it's also known as maggot cheese because <laughs> um, they take the wheel of cheese, they cut the top off and they leave it in, outside and the flies land on it. And then the maggots consume, yeah, I know it's disgusting, <laughs> consume it. And it's called larva gem and fermentation because they basically consume and digest it. And, and the cheese has this pungent <laughs> taste to it. Um, 
They swear they love it. And the thing is, you have to eat it with the live larva because if you get it with the larva are dead, then the cheese is bad. So the ways you can deal with it is you can take a piece and put it in, in a paper bag and wait till you stop hearing the popping because they've died and then you can eat it. You can spread it on toast and then kill them or you just eat them. But it's completely so. illegal. <laughs> it's completely illegal to import to the United States or anywhere in into the EU. Um, because it's, you know, these get in your intestines, you've got issues. And the other thing, oh, the other thing is you must shut your eyes when you're eating it because they can jump up and get in your uh -oh. eyes when you're eating it. <laughs> so there's a fun oh, piece of that for you. Marzu, Marzu, you can look it up. It is absolutely true. And that kind of fun cheese fact, you're like, oh, I heard that. I'm like, that has to go in the book. That has to go. In, I don't know where it's going to go, but that has to go in the book. So, yeah, I got quite the cheese education. Well. <laughs> so what is your, do you have a, a, one of your many favorites, I'm sure, a favorite cheese for you? Currently, uh, it's Roquefort, just because uh, we actually... Uh, in 2019, it was my husband's and I, uh, 25th anniversary, wedding anniversary, and we went to France and um, we were staying in Provence and it was three hours away and we found out where it was because I had written about it in the book about Roquefort. And it's a, one of those, uh, it's one of those cheeses that can only have that name if it's made in the re that particular region. And the French are like, like with the wine and the champagne, if it's not from that area, you better not because they'll come after you because it has a designate place of designated origin. And I had written about Roquefort. And then, see, the thing is, my, it was my, our 25th anniversary, my sister's husband's 50th birthday. They had booked this place like a year in advance and some friends were supposed to go with them. They had canceled. She's like, hey, why don't you come? You can have a free place to stay. Like, you don't have to ask me twice. So that's where we ended up going. And I had already written about Roquefort and then found out it was three hours from where we were staying. And I'm like, can we go? So we did. And we went to the, we went to Roquefort Solazon and we went to the cheese caves and I would get to the right. And I'm just sitting there crying. My husband's like, you are right. I'm like, I can't believe we're here. I wrote about this. And he's like, you need a minute. Like, yeah. <laughs> it was so ridiculous. I'm crying over cheese. <laughs> But we went down there and it was just an, it, it was just amazing. And um, so right now that's my favorite um, just because we had been there and like when we see the packaging, I'm like, yeah, I know where you came from. I know you. Um, and that, that was an amazing uh, trip. And it, I'm like, it's, it's part, we can write part of this off. <laughs> it's, it's part of, <laughs> we went for research, but it was already in the book. Um, and I just, I tweaked it a little bit from what I had written in the book, but the, after being there, but it was, uh, it was amazing. It was amazing. So, um, yeah, I, I like all kinds of cheese and that does all kinds of, I've tried it. I'm just like, yeah, I tried to check it off the list. Uh, that that's, you know, like Limburger. I have found that out that if you have had Limburger and you know, it's very pungent that the bacteria used to turn it into that cheese is actually the same bacteria that is found between your toes. <laughs> That's very appetizing. <laughs> so when you say it smells like stinky feet, you're actually right. So when I found that out recently, I'm like, that's got to go in the next book. It just has to. <laughs> it has to because when you get a reaction like that, but you all did, you're like, oh, oh, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so Does I anybody else have any other questions? No questions, but fascinating. Okay. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah, it's, um, uh, I would recommend self-publishing if anybody was going for that because you do have more control over covers and other stuff. It's a lot more work on your part. Um, but once you do it once, you're like, like this time, it doesn't seem so intimidating once you've done it once. Um, it's like, okay, like, uh, I'm gonna show my book again because, you know, oh, look, it's available in paperback and hardcover. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, for the next book to keep it with the same series because um, I'll have this be the same, the title, I'm gonna keep the same font. 
if you can see, I have the lemon, I don't know, this is my camera, it's kind of, up here it just says Lemmington cheese. This will stay the same. Um, so like all those decisions that I had to make of like what kind of font, what kind of whatever, I don't have to do this next time. Because in a series, you want to keep that the same. And your cover is your best advertising. Um, some people um, don't spend the money on the cover. They want to save money on that. And then they end up having to, there's a lot of advertising stuff that they have to do. Um, and they end up spending a lot of money on advertising to get people to read the book because it's not intriguing enough. Um, I wanted my cover to be, to look like a cozy, but not, um, I, I don't like the trend of some of the, the covers. And if you look at cozies, there's a lot of like paranormal witch ones too, which people like that, that's fine. But there's a lot of white chicks with, with witch hats on, 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 I'm like, well, again, and, you know, it, it's almost like they decide like, oh, you know, the color for this season is teal and red stripes. And you're like, ew, no. But everywhere you look, it's teal and red stripes. But in order for you people to want to buy your stuff, you got have something that might be teal or red to kind of fit in with that. But not, I'm not doing the stripes. So um, it's, it's a tricky balance. I, I looked at one of the other things I did when I wasn't figuring out my, my chapter was look at hundreds of cozy covers, hundreds, and be like, Oh look, there's a there's a manor or something, or there's a building in the back, and there's a girl on the cover. Oh look, there's another cat, and another quilt, and another cupcake. <sighs> okay, so <laughs> you want to be part of that, but yeah, no. So we have cheese. Ta da! <laughs> you found a way to reflect who you are and what the story is about in a way that other people will recognize as, oh, this looks interesting to me. It resonates in some way mm -hmm. with certain people who you will mo more likely enjoy your book because the cover is representative of what's inside. Mm -hmm. and, and every bit of it is a decision. Every bit of it, like, oh, oh wait, I'm gonna show it to you again. On the back, I don't know if you can see it. Oh, this lighting here, like this. See on the back how there's a faint outline of a manner that's because it takes place in the matter. Now this new book is taking place at the Plaza Hotel. I'm going to use the outline of the Plaza on the back. So like I've already made decisions about the cover for the new book. So when I get that, that hopefully the process will be a little quicker um, as opposed to this one. Because it, it actually took two and a half, no, two years and eight months from the time I stepped foot into the writer's group to the time that it was published. That's pretty fast, isn't it? First, yeah, for a first time book, I guess. Um, and I don't have any other novels hidden in some, some drawer someplace. This was going to be my practice one. This was going to be the one I was going to do first because after I got and fell in love with the people who were at the group and just loved being part of that, you know, creative process, um, I thought that I would write this and then I would write like my real one I would publish. But um, it ended up being that this was the one I got published and and now we're going for book two because, you know, why not? See, you had this simmering inside you all this time, mm -hmm. all these years. And so yeah. and it was ready. The other, was it last week? Yeah, last, we were in the middle of getting stuff ready for a wedding and whatever. I, I got up and I wasn't going to get up to write, but I got up because I felt like a character woke me up and my husband's like, please don't tell anybody at the wedding about that because that sounds nuts. I'm like, no, mm -hmm. this. This Russian guy who I had his name, I had some of it, everything that my brain apparently had been working on it. And I got up and I wrote like almost an entire chapter of dialogue with him. And it was so satisfying because it was just like, and it was a stress, it's a stress relief for me too. Because, you know, you can take, check out from <laughs> everything here for a little bit and, and play with your pretend friends. So the only difference is, you know, Writers get paid to uh, <laughs> to talk about their their imaginary friends and um, <laughs> and working and their therapy. So it's kind of like it's a three in one, I guess. Uh, I was wondering, will you use the same similar process? Like, work? Do you still work with the writers group, or uh, having your children involved or since you've written one book and you know better maybe about what people will respond to or 
what is too far-fetched or what you don't have enough clues, are you going to still need, uh, for lack of a word, support for your second writing? Yes, I will. I'm going to do that. I think I'm going to do it a little differently this time because last time I would write a chapter and bring it to the group. Um, this time I had just uh, been reading uh, Stephen King's on writing book where if anybody who is, if there's any list of any books about what to do about writing, Stephen King's on writing book is on every single list. Writers can't agree about anything else. They can't agree like whether you should just, you know, sit down and write with characters or plot the whole thing out. But that particular book I've been reading, and his, his process was that you don't show your first draft to anybody. You get it all out on paper first, and then, then you go back, you let it sit for a while, then you go back, you fix it, and then you start showing it with people. And see, that wouldn't have worked the last time because I was learning the whole thing of how, how to write dialogue, how to uh, create characters, how to show, don't tell, and all that stuff. This time, um, I'm not 100% sure of my plot. So as I'm writing, I haven't shown it to anybody mm -hmm. yet. And I, but I will be, I will be bringing it back to the group because I do value their opinion. Um, I am a little more confident in my writing style now because um, I've gone through this. And um, yeah, my, my kids will still be involved, but I, I kind of want to, uh, I've also been taking a master class um, and I was listening to Dan Brown and he said the same thing that you write like no one's writing because no one really is. And when you're by yourself and you're writing that first draft, you're the only one that's looking at it. And if it, and a lot of times they say that your first draft, it really is garbage. Um, it is kind of, cause you just, you're just kind of getting the ideas on paper, mm -hmm. but I do plan on having them, um, the group and my children do the same kinds of things of, of reading it because they're, opinions and and insight and whatever were great for the story and then there were some things that my kids and the group had suggested to me to change that didn't fit in with my vision of where it was going so mm -hmm. I didn't use that opinion though those opinions but that's fine you know but having people have different ideas about it when they're reading it is also helpful to see how other readers will um, interpret something or how they interpret a character I had one character who um, supposed to be the romantic interest and I had one of my friends who thought he was a creep and thought he was you know and I was like huh that's interesting you know I did not write it that way um, but certain lines that I thought were you know being being sweet she took it as being you know being a player or something so okay. it was just interesting to see like um, the process of how other people take your right and everybody brings their own experience to whatever they're reading Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, um, and, and that's really, really interesting for me how people have pulled out stuff that I'm like, yeah, that, yeah, I meant that. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> or, wow. I, okay. Yeah. And I just, I'm like, I'm glad you got that out of it. I'm okay. That works for me. And I just mm -hmm. find it absolutely fascinating because I had no intentions of that, but because of their life experience and their issues or whatever that they're seeing that in different characters and it's just i'm a people person so that, that that's just fascinating to me mm -hmm. that did you me. did you change the character somewhat when your the friend said that he was creepy did you no. change some of the you left it <laughs> yeah i left i left it because um it worked because if some people thought that he was um guilty Oh, yeah. Yay. You know, uh, you know yeah. if some uh -huh. people come out of character saying that that was what, you know, okay. But it was just fascinating to me that that never, that thought never crossed my mind with that character. Other ones you're like, all right, I'm doing this misdirection. I want these kinds of comments to read this way, but she's really doing this, or this is what he really is, or this is what he's really, this is what his really is his mental state, but it's going to come across this way. For him, it was just, it was supposed to be kind of like this, but because other people come with things that are different and that's, that's just in, very, very interesting to me. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, and it, it's, it's more intriguing. You're like, okay, what can I do next you know, <laughs> in the next book? You know, but um, I plan on the, the process of writing it a, a lot more than I did last time. 
maybe I'll write more of the book before I start sharing it. Oh, because uh-huh. you know, my son Daniel, who was Archibald Fartworthy, he works. He's uh, has he works for Lockheed Martin, and he they have government contracts, so he can't talk about any of this, and he loves that stuff. Um, and uh, but he's an introvert. And he has that personality. Me, if I worked with something, I'd be like, I'm working on the coolest thing and I have to talk. So I don't know if I can wait till the end mm-hmm. of my book before I share it with anybody. I might, I might explode beforehand. It, 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 this might be a cheese explosion before. So uh, <laughs> we'll see how far I get. At least I want to make sure I have the whole pot, or like at least figured out like who the, the web of secrets, which I don't have. It hasn't gelled yet. Mm-hmm. so but yeah and, and my kids are excited about they're like okay mom you gotta get writing I'm like yeah I know there's been a lot on my mind because <laughs> we've had a wedding we got a confirmation we've got first a holy communion we've got there's all these different things my, my one daughter's taking the SATs she's they, they were supposed to be taking regents we got the school stuff all these things you know there's a corner of my brain that needs to to be quiet to be able to make <laughs> another book so a bit. Well, I want to I want to respect your time, Michelle. Thank you so much for um, sharing with us your process and your thoughts and your ideas. It just gives us a lot of insight into how this works because we all love to read. Um, and so, thank you so much. And thank you so much for yeah. inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. I'm going to stop the recording. Uh, save the